first. My name is Amanda, I'm 25 years old, and I live in San Jacinto, California. All of the names of the people I mentioned are changed for privacy, except mine. The reason I'm writing here today is that my girlfriend Rebecca was kidnapped by a cult, and I have reason to believe that they're coming for me next. I wouldn't post this publicly if I wasn't in dire need of help, and trust me, I've tried the cops. I think Old Ranger Johnny is in on the whole thing anyway. Looking over what I've written here, I have lots of regrets now. I think this whole thing might be my fault. I don't have time to tell you my life story, so I'll just start about one week ago. August 18th, a Friday morning. Rebecca and I were headed up Mount San Jacinto with a couple of friends. We'll call them Amy and Jacob, to go camping. We all stuffed ourselves into Amy's mom's old hatchback, a rusted over olive green little thing. It was cramped, but Rebecca and I chilled in the back and played some phone games for as long as the reception would allow. Luckily, the most modern thing about this old car was its AC, which Amy's parents had just installed a couple months ago. Otherwise, we would have baked in the heat. We planned to camp in Idlewild for a week and make the most of the last week of summer break. We all go to college down in Hemet, and the fall semester is supposed to start next week. Now, we've been camping together before in all sorts of places. Idlewild isn't exactly on the top of the list of prettiest places we've stayed. Not by a long shot. But it's close by in low maintenance. We had our whole week planned out. Fishing, hiking, barbecuing, the works. We all brought camcorders along because, well, what kind of film students would we be if we didn't? It was about five-ish by the time we got to Idlewild. We rented a cabin because, hey, fuck bugs. We'd see plenty of those during the day and we didn't want to deal with it while we slept. When we rolled up to our cabin, Rebecca jumped in her seat and grabbed my arm pretty tight. I asked her what was wrong, but she only shook her head and mumbled that she thought she saw something. I took a quick look around and didn't see anything out of the ordinary. I chalked it up to her being carsick, since I certainly was. We were all pretty eager to get out of the cramped little car. The cabin keys, of which we got two, were in a Ziploc bag taped to the front door. Also inside the bag was a note. It was on some gross-looking yellow paper. It looked ancient. Amy unfolded it and read it to us out loud. Welcome to Idlewild. We hope that you enjoy your stay in our historic park. We only have a few rules, which are as follows. Do not leave food unattended. It will attract bears. Do not vandalize the cabin or any of the surrounding areas. And absolutely, no matter what, do not go near the woods after sundown. Please enjoy your time in Idlewild. In place of the signature was a faded stamp, some kind of bird in a circle. I hadn't seen that logo on any of the signs in town, but maybe this was just an old notice they reused to save paper. It was a nice cabin, old but well kept. It had running water, gas, electricity, and even a TV. There was a bookshelf in the living room covered in dusty old hardcovers, and a little box by the TV with DVDs that were at least 10 years out of date. We spent the night inside, playing board games, watching movies, and getting maybe just a little more drunk than we had planned. About halfway through our drunken commentary on the happening, Amy slipped off to her room to go to sleep. We had a two-bedroom cabin, one for Amy, one for Rebecca and I, and Jacob offered to take the couch. Rebecca and I stumbled into bed a little past midnight, and we were out cold the moment our faces hit the pillow. It was about three in the morning when I was awoken by a crash. I fumbled around the nightstand for my glasses and cell phone and reached over to wake up Rebecca. She wasn't in bed, and her phone wasn't on the nightstand. At this point, I started to freak out a little bit, but I guessed that there was a reasonable explanation. Maybe she heard the crash first and got up to investigate. The crash came again, just as I found the source. The front door was open, and the flimsy screen door was opening and being slammed shut by the rain. Amy and Jacob had beat me to the living room, and their faces said it all. Something was wrong. That's when something outside caught my eye. A shoe. A red Doc Martin boot. Rebecca's boot. Shit. This is where those regrets start kicking in. I don't regret looking for Rebecca. Maybe none of this would have happened if I stayed and waited for her to come back. Maybe not. But I love her. Anyone else would have done the same. What I do regret is going out alone. Once Amy and Jacob decided that they'd rather wait for the sun to come up. 
I regret not mentioning how tight Rebecca's boots got and how it couldn't have just slipped off unless she hadn't put it on all the way. I regret not grabbing a knife from our fishing bag. I regret not calling for the park rangers. I could go on and on, but there's one thing above all. Back in the car, when Rebecca got spooked, I so badly wish it, I had taken another second to really look around. Maybe I would have seen the hooded figure right before it disappeared into the woods. Maybe we would have gotten back home, or hell, even stayed at the place in town. Maybe Amy and Jacob would still be alive. None of that crossed my mind as I slipped into my own hiking boots and grabbed a coat. By the time I was running deep into the woods, yelling Rebecca's name, I had already forgotten about that note on the door, that ever so important final rule. Besides, it was just bears out here, right? I know that last post was pretty short. I'm really sorry, guys. I'm in hiding for reasons that will become clear with this update, and it's pretty hard for me to find time to write. As a result, I guess this one's pretty short, too. After I ran into the woods, I spent the entire night searching for Rebecca. I screamed her name until my throat was raw and went so deep that it took me a couple hours to get back out. The sun was just peeking up over the horizon when I stumbled back onto the campsite, feeling utterly hopeless. I could tell something was up as soon as I got near the cabin. The door was still wide open. I knew Amy and Jacob had pretty much gone right back to bed before I went out searching. But why wouldn't they have noticed the open door? And Jacob was supposed to be sleeping on the couch. My answer was lying in the center of the living room floor, staining the old wooden boards with a deep red. The body was almost unrecognizable, spread eagle and pinned to the floor with knives. Underneath the corpse was the symbol from the letter, a bird inside a circle. The same symbol was carved into the body's chest. The face was covered up with a dark towel. I don't know how long I stood there taking it in, and I don't know why it took so long for the reality to hit me. Maybe I was sleep deprived. Whatever the case, I managed to inch my way across the room and just lightly tug at a rag. When I finally lost it, it was Jacob. I had barely stopped screaming by the time the park ranger showed up. I was sitting on the porch soaked in tears and bleeding from scratches I hadn't noticed, but that I must have gotten in the woods. In between sobs, I managed to tell the rangers everything. This was park ranger Johnny, who I mentioned briefly in a previous post. Johnny, his badge said John, but he insisted to be called Johnny. He was in his 50s, with the eyes of a tired old man who had seen too much. His partner was Carl, who looked only a year or two older than me. Johnny took my statement down, jotting notes in the margins every now and then. When I had finished, he silently read over his notes for a solid minute or two. Finally, he looked me in the eye and said, You went into the woods after dark? I was just about ready to explode then. My girlfriend was missing. What was I supposed to do? I wasn't afraid of any wild animals, and a human life is more important than any rules, regardless of the danger. Johnny shook his head. Miss, those rules are there for a reason. If your friend disregarded the warning and went off on her own, that's her own problem. I scowled when he emphasized friend. I sat outside while the rangers went to investigate the rest of the cabin. I was shaking, but things were only about to get worse. You're going to want to take a look at this. It was Carl. His voice wavered as he beckoned me inside. My heart sunk as I realized that I still hadn't seen Amy. Johnny was down at the end of the hall, and the look on his face told me all I needed to know. It was knowing, familiar. He scribbled something down on his notepad, which he quickly flipped closed when he saw me approach. He stepped aside and mumbled something about being sorry. As I stepped into the room, there she was, hanging from the rafters, a noose around her neck, and a gash in her stomach. At her feet was a bucket filled with blood. On the wall in Amy's blood was a note in just three simple words. We warned you. I stumbled out of the room and threw up in the hall. The next few days were a blur. I was brought in for questioning at the police department in San Jacinto, but the park ranger's statements helped clear me of suspicion. I spent a day or two in the apartment I shared with Rebecca, the shock and fear of keeping me confined to the bed. At some point, I remember doing research on local crimes, religious cults, and the source of that bird symbol. 
I couldn't really find anything. Sandy Cento is home of the international headquarters of the Church of Scientology, but everyone knows that here. I don't think it's relevant. Unfortunately, though, Scientology colored the majority of the search results and made finding any info that much harder. The official statement came out on Wednesday afternoon. Amy, Jacob, and Rebecca had been the victims of a bear attack. Bullshit. I'm confident that there are very few, if any, bears in Idlewild. They live more towards the north, maybe Pinewood or up in Humber Park. I've never seen a bear in Idlewild. Besides, bears don't make blood sacrifices or leave creepy in signals on their victims. Somebody's covering this up either to save face or because they know something. This whole situation is fucked up. Thursday morning is when everything changed. I found an envelope which had been slid underneath my front door. It was sealed with that godforsaken symbol and addressed to me. This was enough to set off alarms in my head. They know where I live? What do they want from me? Inside was a Polaroid of Rebecca. She looked sick tired, completely downtrodden, but alive. There was fear in her eyes. Just to the side was a cell phone held in somebody else's hand, displaying the date, August 23rd. They had taken the photo and brought it to me the very same day. On the back of the photo was a note. Do not look for us. Do not report this to the police. And do not tell anybody. As far as the world is concerned, the girl is dead. Move on with your life or there will be consequences. So, of course, I went to the police. I panicked, you know. I couldn't just sit at home and do nothing. The police promised to look into it, but told me to stay home and try to relax. Fucking relax. I didn't even have the chance to relax if I wanted to. When I got home, my door had been smashed open. In the middle of my living room was a circle of red. With a dead bird in the center. A raven. I didn't even bother to call the cops. My mind's been made up. I'm going out to find Rebecca no matter what it takes. I packed clothes, food, stuff like that. Left town on Wednesday night. No way I was spending another night in that apartment. It was a good thing too, because Thursday morning's breaking news was that the entire apartment complex had spontaneously caught fire overnight. Foul play was suspected, and the fire originated in my apartment. I've been staying in a motel in Val Vista for the past couple days, getting my bearings and planning for my next move. By the time I upload this, I'll have moved on, but I'll keep posting wherever and whenever I get the chance. I need places to stay. The last thing I saw as I left on Wednesday night was a person in a red hooded robe standing on my street corner. I'm confident that's what Rebecca saw when she got to the campsite. And I'm equally confident that's who burned down my apartment. I'm adding red robes to my research. Maybe something will come up. If anybody knows anything at all, please let me know. One last thing in case I don't update again. To any law enforcement officials, my name is Amanda Williams. I am a San Jacinto resident, and everything I've written here is true. If I'm never heard from again, or if I turn up dead, I want to make it clear that I did not take my own life. I can't tell you where I'm going next, but I promise I will keep you up to date. If I haven't posted anything by September 1st, 2017, assume that I am dead.